I'm now looking for the file that I had so nicely before. Uh, anybody see? I see Purdue.pdf, but I don't think that's the right file I want, but I will try it. No, that's in tech shop. Uh, can you guys see this? Uh, yeah, we can see yeah. the PDF file. Okay, so I guess I'll, I'll I'll give the talk from this file, even though I wanted to give it from a Adobe PDF file. All right, so let me begin by saying I used to spend a lot of time at uh, Purdue with Brad Lucier, and I have very fond memories. I haven't been there in probably about 10 years, but uh, Purdue lives close to my heart. Uh, so in regards to this uh, learning, uh, I've been trying in the last uh, several months to get my arms around uh, deep learning. A lot of the ideas are sort of counterintuitive to me. And so this talk is a mathematical, uh, a mathematician's uh, view of the problem and hopefully it'll illuminate uh, some of the foundational issues in this area. So what is a learning problem? To me, it's the following. We have uh, some unknown function f that I'll assume is real valued. And we have some data about f. And from that data, we want to construct a function f hat, which I think of as an approximation to f that will predict what f looks like away from the data. Uh, you can keep in mind a very simple example where your data comes from an interval zero one and you have a univariate function. This is not very much not the typical problem we address in deep learning, but it's still a useful toy example to keep in mind. Uh, the real applications are in very high dimensions where the function is a function of D variables where D is huge. Typically, the number of pixels in an image, for example, when you're doing classification and the like. I'm going to assume that the measurements are noiseless. You can uh, put a layer of noise on top of this if you like, but I, I like to separate the issues of noise and noiseless uh, because I think it illustrates uh, uh, more easily what's going on. So let's begin with the mathematical formulation of the problem. How would a mathematician view? this problem. First thing, if somebody came into his office and said, uh, hey, I have this data and I want uh, an algorithm to uh, tell me what the function looks like away from the data, mathematician would say, well, look, I can't tell you anything unless you give me some extra information about F because it could be anything away from the data. This extra information we typically call model class information. So if you're solving a PDE, this may be some regularity results for PDEs, or uh, if you're in another domain, you should try to extract what information you actually know uh, about uh, the uh, function you're trying to find. So that's the first point. And this is uh, uh, rather important because uh, in deep learning, frequently, you don't see model classes at least explicitly uh, discussed. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. Another issue a mathematician would say, well, please tell me how we're going to evaluate algorithms at the end of the day. If I come up with this clever algorithm and I think it's a great way to recover this uh, f, that is to create this function f hat, uh, how are we going to decide whether I did a good job? And in uh, mathematics, we like to do this via some norm. And uh, so that's what I'll assume, that there is a, a sign to me, a norm, how we're going to measure the error after I've created F hat. Namely, I'll look at the uh, deviation between F and what I've created in F hat. And I'm going to assume that this norm is a Hilbert space norm, although uh, whatever I say can be carried out in a general Bonnach space norm. 
And you can look at this paper here to see how that's done. The data I'm gonna assume are given by linear functionals applied to F, so it's linear data. And so what do I know about F? Uh, the totality of information I know about F is that it's in this model class K and that it satisfies the data. So I let KW be the co collection of all functions in K which satisfies the data. That is all I know about F. It could be any function in, in KW as far as the information that was given to me. Well, given the setting, there is actually mathematically a very easy description of the best recovery that you can make. That is the best approximation F hat you can give to F, given that F is any one of these functions in KW. And it's most easily explained by a graphic here. So let's let uh, KW be this blue set. Uh, so the blue set here in this uh, graphic indicates all functions, so this is in my Hilbert space, all functions that satisfy the data and lie in K. So this is the set KW. The best I could, so I, that's all I know about F. So the best I could do to approximate F is to take the center of the smallest ball that contains uh, KW. This is called the Chebyshev ball, and its uh, center is Chebyshev center, and the radius of the Chebyshev radius. And that's the best error you could uh, ever attain, and the best algorithm would uh, take your data and find U star. How to do that numerically is a big issue, but that would be, if you could achieve that, be the best uh, algorithm. In reality, this is a very hard problem to find U star, and we, we do surrogates to that problem. And we would be happy if we found any point close to this, uh, this ball. In particular, if we found any point in the ball, we would know we were within a factor two of the best performance, and that would be satisfactory uh, to us. Okay, so there is a an optimal solution and the, the optimal error you would get is this R star of R of KW, the radius of this ball. Hopefully everybody followed that. All right, now let's uh, try to understand what does the data give? What does the data tell me? Since I'm operating in a Hilbert space, uh, uh, the data are linear functionals in the Hilbert space. And so there's something in mathematics called the Ries representer theorem that says every linear functional is the inner product with an element omega j from the Hilbert space. These are called the Ries representers of this data functionals. So the I could take these omega j's, which ostensibly would be known to me. For example, if you think about point evaluation, you may think of the delta function as uh, the omega j. Uh, I can form the span of the omega j's. This is a subspace of my Hilbert space. And the information I get from the data, it tells me what the projection of f is onto this finite dimensional space w. So it could give me the projection of F onto W, which we denote by PW of F. What I don't know is how F looks away from the data. And that mathematically is we don't know the component of F in the direction of the orthogonal complement of W called W perp. And what we wanna do is we wanna use our knowledge about F to predict what PW perp of F is. So that is in essence the problem. What is F off of the data? What does F look like in this W perp direction? There's a simple graphic to explain here what's going on in this graphic. Uh, there's a blue blob here, a three-dimensional blob. I, I mean, the graphic is in 3D, so it's not very illustrative of the high dimensional problem. But the, the blue blob is my set K, right? That's my model class. That's, I know F is in the blue 
blue region here. What does KW tell me? It tells me uh, that uh, there is, a, in general, a hyperplane cutting through this blue blob. In my 3D example, this is just a line segment. These are all functions. Uh, if you extended the line off to infinity in both directions, this would be all functions that satisfy the data. And what I uh, know is that F is on this line segment, on this line, but I also know it's in K, in the model class K. So I actually know it's on the line segment that enters K and then exits K. And so F is any point on this line segment. And the, as we already discussed, the best we could do to recover would be sort of to take the midpoint of the line segment in, in this case. Okay, so that's our, our problem to find what is the uh, component of F in this W perp direction. Now I want, so you would say at this stage, well, it's a lot of mathematical nonsense. It doesn't tell me a mathematical algorithm or a numerical algorithm to actually do the job. How do I find the center of this Chebyshev ball? So let us now entertain uh, what are possible numerical algorithms. Of course, the best and most commonly used is least squares. What would you do in least squares? You would find a space sigma here, a finite dimensional, typically a finite dimensional linear space. And try to solve this problem, look at all functions in this linear space and find one that's uh, close to satisfying the data. And in the old days, we always took uh, the dimension of the space smaller than M. Our rationale was we didn't want to fit noise if we had noisy data and various things. So we took the dimension to be less than M. And current, uh, deep learning, one typically takes n a lot bigger than m, over-parameterized deep learning, right? And moreover, you don't take sigma to be a linear space, you take it to be a nonlinear manifold. So the typical setting in deep learning is a, to take a nonlinear manifold with a number of parameters much larger than the, the number of data points. So here now you're gonna have non-uniqueness. And so which of the functions, you're gonna have many functions that are gonna give you error zero here. So which of those functions are you gonna pick? That would be to me, the question to ask somebody in deep learning, what function are you choosing if you're using over-parameterized uh, manifolds, which function are you choosing to fit uh, the data? I know I can fit the data exactly. Which guy are you going to choose? So I'd like to understand what's going on there. Now, uh, if you think, first I want to tell you that uh, least squares absolutely does not uh, meet our goal. If you try to analyze least squares and say, okay, I, I pick a space sigma and I do least squares, can I prove anything in terms of the function that I've created f hat matching my goal of being a optimal or near optimal algorithm for learning in, in terms of uh, giving me an error that's close to the best error I can achieve, which I discussed on the earlier slides. The answer is no. And the reason is that although you may have used this model class K in the beginning to choose your space sigma or your manifold sigma, you may say, oh, well, I'll, I'll choose a sigma that approximates the elements in K very well. So even though you've done that, you at after you've done that, when you do least squares, you throw away completely your knowledge that F is in K. So when you solve this problem, K is not appearing. You've, you've only used K to select sigma. So the bottom line is least squares does not fill, fit, uh, fulfill our goal. 
uh, is there a remedy? And the answer is yes. Penalized least squares will do the job. So what is penalized least squares? So let's take our model class K and let me assume, and, and you can get around this, but for the moment, let me, let me assume that this set K, this model class, which is a set of functions in the Hilbert space, I want to assume that this model class is convex and symmetric about the origin. In this case, and this is rather typical, by the way, of most model classes like Sobolev spaces, Besov classes, and and and, and uh, Baron classes in your uh, in, in uh, deep learning and the like are all uh, strictly convex and symmetric about the origin. In this case, uh, you can view K as a unit ball of a, a, a Banach space. Y, which is a subspace of H. In fact, you define Y via uh, the norm on Y is defined via K. K would be the unit ball of that norm. So if you view it in this way, then, then if you solve one of these two constrained optimization problems, then you would have a, a, a near optimal solution or an optimal solution. What are these constrained optimization problems? Now they're not numerical because I'm gonna look at all functions in the Hilbert space to satisfy the data. And I'll find the one which minimizes the norm of uh, G and Y. What does that mean? That since I know that my original function F which beget the data was in Y, this function F lambda hat will actually be in k will be in the model class so this will be a function in the model class f lambda hat and it will satisfy the data so it lies in that chebyshev ball and we know by my earlier remarks that this uh will then be a near optimal algorithm with a constant Two. Sometimes one prefers to put this in the lasso uh, framework where you add the penalty term here with a parameter lambda in front. And then you can show that if you drive lambda to zero, make lambda small enough, again, you do get a, a optimal solution or near optimal solution to our original problem. So what does this tell me and suggest to me? It says, ah, Look here, the problem with this, this isn't a numerical algorithm because I have to search over all of H here. However, it tells me uh, some information that maybe said maybe what they're doing in deep learning makes sense. Namely, since I can't do this over H, I have to take a set sigma as a surrogate for H, and I'll take a linear or nonlinear manifold as my surrogate for H, and I would like that manifold to be uh, bigger and bigger and bigger. That is, I'd like to do over-parameterized, uh, solve an over-parameterized problem because this will get me closer and closer to having, uh, uh, to emulating H in this minimization problem. So this simple exercise tells me, well, these guys aren't so stupid. Uh, maybe it makes sense to solve a, uh, over-parameterized learning uh, problem. And uh, the fact that they don't uh, necessarily regularize, that is inject K into the picture, this suggests to me that, well, I need to inject K into the picture, but in the lasso formulation, it can be in a very weak form because it's only when lambda tends to zero that I get the optimal solution. So I hope, at this stage, people have uh, uh, see some of the motivation for what they're doing in deep learning. Okay, now let's talk about uh, actual numerical algorithms. That was the pseudo numerical algorithm because I had to uh, search over all of H, which we can't do. So, what we do in reality is we try to, we replace H by a linear or nonlinear space sigma. 
and we solve the corresponding problem, not where we minimize over all of H, but over sigma. Now, of course, we're gonna incur some error. The bigger we can take sigma, the, 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 the finer the space sigma is, the better we're going to do. And one can give, in fact, a quantitative estimate. I don't wanna get into it uh, uh, too deeply, but you can give a, a, an estimate that tells you how close you are to actually solving, uh, giving an optimal solution to the learning problem. And it depends on how well sigma or how nice sigma is at filling up H as measured by the distance of your model class uh, to sigma in this y norm. Okay, so uh, let, let's now talk about what uh, a typical, so th this tells me a numerical uh, strategy for solving the, the learning problem that I could can prove, it will give me a near optimal solution. Let's now talk about what deep learning does. How difficult this uh, solving this uh, numerical problem is, is um, I haven't discussed. This is a very difficult problem in high dimensions to do, but I haven't discussed that yet. But let's see what a typical learning algorithm does. So what does a deep learning algorithm do? It takes its data and it divides it into two sets a training set and a test set. It takes uh, for sigma, remember I said you want a good space sigma to approximate your model class. It takes sigma as a highly over-parameterized neural network. So it uses neural networks and it uses neural networks with a lot of parameters, many more parameters than the number of data. Okay. Uh, it then prescribes a loss, could be the square loss that I mentioned before, or it may have a square loss with a penalty. Typically, there is no penalty. And it goes and tries to solve the, uh, find, uh, uh, minimize the empirical loss over this class sigma, right? So that, that's what the deep learning uh, algorithm is attempting to do. It does this by starting with an initial guess for the parameters of the neural network, and then utilizes either gradient descent or some uh, relative to gradient des descent, such as stochastic gradient descent, to update the parameter choice. It, it, you know, how it implements this gradient descent is a real issue. There's something called the learning rate, which tells you the step size is you're going to utilize in gradient descent. And there is, in my reading, I don't see too explicitly the stopping criteria. When, how do you decide when to stop when you're doing the iterations of gradient descent? Uh, and, and, and at the end of the day, after they create their F hat using the technology I just described, uh, they evaluate performance on the test data by something called generalization error. We're gonna get into this in a, in a moment, what generalization error is, put this on the side for the moment. But uh, the important thing is they don't certify the performance of their algorithm in a mathematical sense of an error estimate. They instead look at an empirical quantity, namely this generalization error, which is seeing how well, the F hat they created performed on the test data. Okay, so my initial reaction to this uh, way of doing things is the following. I'm bothered by the fact that there's not generally a, a model class lurking in, in, in the background in this, either in the formulation of the problem or in the analysis part of the problem. As I mentioned, if you don't have a model class, you can't prove anything. So this, this is a red flag to me. Uh, a second thing is uh, there's not a, a, a precise formulation in their implementation of gradient descent. 
in terms of the learning rate, initialization, stopping criteria, et cetera. Different people do different things. And it's not like I'm telling you that if, if you use this initialization, this stopping criteria, this learning rate, I guarantee certain performance. We don't see that. So the design of algorithms is, uh, I would say, more a work of art uh, versus what one typically does in numerical analysis. Another point, which I'll say something briefly on a little later, is that there's no restriction on the computational budget. That is to say, how long do they spend offline learning F hat? How many iterations of gradient descent? How much tweaking? What do they do offline? Uh, this is contrary to what we do in numerical analysis, where we we sort of say, well, we know that the more computation we do, the better. So we're interested in what is our error versus the number, uh, the amount of computation. So uh, the bottom line is that this world that they live in is quite different than the world of mathematics or numerical analysis, where we look for certified performance with guaranteed error estimates versus the amount of the computational effort we have put forward. Okay, let me move on now. So let me talk about uh, some of these uh, components of, uh, of uh, deep learning. The first thing I want to talk a little bit about, and I think a lot of this conference will, will touch on this subject, is why do they choose uh, neural networks as the vehicle for uh, creating their algorithm. Well, they must think that neural nets provide a good approximation to this model class, even though they haven't explicitly told me what the model class K is, they somehow think that it provides a, a good uh, approximation. And secondly, that it's somehow numerically friendly. It should be easy to implement uh, neural nets. And so what I want to do is uh, address uh, these two issues. Why is it a good approximation? If so, why? And is it numerically friendly? So there are a lot of uh, uh, several expositions on the approximation properties of neural nets. I mentioned Alan Pincus originally. This is getting now a bit old and doesn't concentrate on the deep neural nets is typically a single layer neural net that it analyzes, but uh, these other articles go into uh, deep neural nets uh, uh, more deeply. Okay, so uh, what, what, let, let's first take a perspective on what neural net approximation is. In neural net approximation, what we do is we, we prescribe an architecture for the neural net and we prescribe an activation function sigma for the neural net. Once we do that, if we look at the functions that are created by varying the parameters, as you vary the parameters of the neural network, and let me call n the total number of parameters you're using, deeper and wider networks would use more and more parameters, right? But the collection of functions that you produce is a nonlinear manifold, right? As you vary the parameters, you get a different function, and this is the manifold. And this manifold has a little bit of structure, namely, it's a Lipschitz manifold. You can prove that if you restrict the parameters to lie in some ball in Rn, Rn, this is the uh, set of uh, all parameters, uh, that this is a Lipschitz uh, function on this ball. So Again, what is MN? Given that I've chosen the parameters A to approximate F, MN of A would be the function that I produce. Turns out to be, if I think, for example, of uh, ReLU activation, the function I produce will be a piecewise polynomial on a very complicated partition. And uh, so it's a, a, a function that depends on, on uh, the parameters that I've chosen. 
And MN is, uh, uh, describes uh, what this function is as uh, I vary the parameters A. Now, what is an approximation method? Uh, so in, in deep learning, you use gradient descent or stochastic uh, gradient descent to decide what the parameters are. And uh, so the approximation component of uh, is, is how do I find, given F, how do I find the parameters for F? Okay. What deep learning does is it uses gradient descent and a loss function, et cetera, to find the parameters. But you can view the approximation process as uh, selecting, uh, given F, selecting the parameters. And I denote that mapping by AN. So uh, it, the form of approximation that's encompassed by uh, deep learning and neural nets is what we call manifold approximation. We're approximating not from a linear space, not by something like polynomials or uh, splines, where we have a fixed linear space. We're approximating from a nonlinear manifold. And we have these two mappings that describe one, what the manifold looks like, and second, how we select the uh, parameters. So if you want to say, well, gee, uh, neural nets are great at approximating, my first reaction would be, well, oh, I didn't know you, you were going to allow this general form of manifold approximation. And if you allow me to do that, let me try to understand what manifold approximation could do in general. And the bottom line is manifold approximation can be fantastic. Why? Because you know that you can find face filling manifolds. You can find a one parameter manifold, a, per, a manifold depending on only one parameter that fills all of K. So if you open the door to me and say, you're going to use manifolds to do the approximation, I say, well, wait, wait a minute, be, be cautious because I could take a one parameter manifold and use that for the approximation instead of your neural nets, which use a lot of parameters. Of course, the problem is that these one parameter manifolds are, are very unstable. As you search to find a good parameter, changing the parameter ever so slightly changes the function mn of a, a, a tremendous amount leading to high instability. And uh, so keep that in mind. Neural nets are opening the door for instability. We, in fact, know, you know, this classical example of instability that you trained a network for a classification problem of identifying uh, what objects are in an image and, and uh, you train it in, and Part of the training is uh, this image, which is correctly classified as a pig. And then you subject it to a little bit of noise. And what you find out is uh, if you add a little bit of noise to this uh, image, you get something that looks like exactly like your original image, and yet it's classified incorrectly. So the algorithms are very unstable. This reflects the fact that the uh, function mn is uh, although it's Lipschitz, it has a very large Lipschitz constant. So instability is an issue. Okay, now let me say a few words about neural net approximation. So, I, I mean, people write, there are lots of papers written on this, uh, making claims that, well, neural nets do a great job at approximating. So do they? Well, I'll just give you my quick view uh, of the situation. I think that uh, Zwawe will talk about the uh, results of this type. Namely that we know that uh, neural nets can do a better job than classical methods. It, first of all, it does at least as well as classical methods of approximation, which I mean, by which I mean polynomials, splines, wavelets, uh, and the like, finite element methods. Anything that those methods can do, you can prove that neural nets with the same number of parameters or the same complexity do as well. 
Second, you have the super performing results that say they actually do much better. For example, a lip one function on zero one can be approximated to accuracy n to the minus two with n parameters. This defies what we normally get in numerical analysis. Normally we would only get n to the minus one. And so you might look at this and say, wow, that's it. That explains why neural nets are so great. They do better than classical methods. They have this super convergence rate. In fact, you can prove super convergence in a very, very general setting. I think as we will talk about super convergence for Sobolev balls and, and the like, but we'll see what his talk uh, unfolds. Uh, my point is that the super convergence results, interesting, very interesting mathematically, but uh, they have to be unstable. In fact, there, there, there are theorems that tell you they're necessarily unstable mapping. So it will be hard to find this super uh, performing approximation. Uh, and then this is where I would say, well, if you, you give me an unlimited time to look and search for this approximate, then uh, uh, maybe I can find it. Because if you put no budget on my computational time, maybe I can search over this manifold and find this great approximation. I think the real value in uh, neural net approximation lies in the fact that there are model, new model classes, not the classical ones of uh, classical smoothness like Lipschitz, Sobolev, Bessoff, but new model classes where uh, neural nets are provably good at approximating. You're probably familiar with Baron classes which are the convex, basically the convex hall of the ReLU dictionary. This is actually an inflation of the Baron class a little bit. Uh, but there are other ones and built on uh, the ideas of self-similarity, uh, fractals, uh, iterated function systems and the like. And I kind of feel that maybe these are the reason why uh, neural nets are a good method to choose to build your numerical platform to do learning. That they're very robust, that they cover a lot of model classes, not only the classical model classes, but very different new model classes that might match the application you're interested in. Okay, so let me now talk a bit about uh, data. So one question you could ask is, uh, well, how do I know I have enough data? You know, if I, of course, I think in, in uh, many of the modern applications, they have a humongous amount of data. And so they may say, well, that's not an issue for us. But to a mathematician, we would say, well, do we have enough data? So if we have our model class and we're given M pieces of information, uh, how well can we recover a function f in this model class from these m pieces of information? The bigger that m is, the better we can do, right, in general. So there are ways to measure how well you can do. The most uh, famous is the Galfon width that says that if you allow any m linear measurements, that is, any m linear functionals, then it tells you if you choose these linear functionals, these data sites as best possible for the set K, then it tells you how well you can do. So in your given uh, setting, you'll never do better than uh, the Galfon width. So I think it's important, uh, my view of the subject is you need a model class and it's important to understand what the Galfon width of the model class is to understand how much information, how many measurements M you would need to attain a certain uh, accuracy. The delta M would tell you the accuracy, the best accuracy you could attain with M uh, measurements. Uh, now, of course, in learning, we typically don't have general linear functionals for measurements we use point values, right? We 
have the values of function at some points x, j. So this would be, it wouldn't fit into Galphon widths exactly because Galphon widths allow any linear functional. And here we have to use point evaluation. So you can introduce an analog of Galphon width when you see the P on the bottom here, the P stands for that, the fact that I've restricted my measurements to be point evaluation. And delta M uh, P would tell me the best error I could do if I could optimally choose the points X1, XM for the set K. So I know K, I now look for the best points and delta M P would tell me the best error. And it will be worse than the Galphon width, but it would be interesting to know for a given model class, how does this behave as M tends to infinity? And then finally, you, you know, you have the problem that, well, you don't get to choose the points, right? You're given the measurements. Those points have been chosen, the XJ, have been chosen for you. You didn't get to choose them. So what do they do in deep learning? They say, yeah, 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 you, you were given those points, but we assume that these points were a uh, random draw from some probability distribution. And so you could say, well, all right, given a random draw, how well do you perform? And now, of course, the draw can be bad or it could be good, but you can say, okay, on average, how well do I perform? That is, for example, an expectation, what would be the best I could recover? So my point is here is it would be very useful if in deep learning, one analyze these quantities, Galphon widths, point-wise Galphon widths, and the average width to understand how much data you need to learn uh, functions from a given model class. Okay, so if you propose a model class, uh, I, I'm sort of, I just said it, uh, you should evaluate these quantities to understand how good your model class is, how many measurements you will need, do you break the curse of dimensionality, questions of this type. Uh, one, the, the point of uh, that discussion that I gave is that to understand whether a model class is good is not simply a matter of understanding whether neural nets can approximate well the functions in the model class. In fact, there's a gap between how well you approximate and how well you do from data. And this is now being uh, enumerated in uh, some papers. It's called the theory to, to practice gap. All right. So I've push model classes. I think when I talk to people doing deep learning, they don't typically use model classes and they argue against it. So what is their viewpoint? Their viewpoint is, well, we have an algorithm and we know our algorithm is great, right? We know this deep learning does a wonderful job. We can show you empirically in a lot of examples that it's uh, doing well. We don't have a model class, but uh, we somehow know that deep learning is picking out uh, a certain function as how it uh, takes the uh, data and extends the function off of the data. And there are attempts to explain what that function is. You're probably familiar with neural tangent uh, uh, kernels for single layer networks, and people are trying to uh, understand what is happening in deeper networks. So their view is that, well, we have a good algorithm. It wasn't that we started with a problem where we knew the model class and now we'll, we'll uh, create an algorithm depending on the model class. No, we forget the model class. We have the algorithm and now we'll try to understand in essence, which uh, model class was lurking in the background that our, a numerical algorithm was actually uh, finding. So this is a, a different view. And one thing that bothers me is that uh, since they're using the same algorithm, no matter what the underlying model class was, that, that seems very strange to me. It seems to me different problems should uh, 
indicate different learning algorithms. Now they, they would argue that, well, we do that by ch changing the activation function, by changing the architecture, maybe changing learning rates, et cetera. But then it becomes sort of an art to figure out what uh, the algorithm is. Okay. Well, I'm going to interrupt just a minute. You've got, we've got just about uh, three or four minutes left before yeah. uh, we have to move on. Yeah, I'm going to move fast, OK? Uh, OK, so I'll do this in, in one minute. I, I, I said, OK, what functions are, are we learning when we use deep learning? So I said, let's take a simple example. Let's take the function x squared. I'll give you data at 100 equally spaced points on 0, 1. You tell me what function you generated. What is f hat when you use deep learning? I put it into TensorFlow, I get nonsense out. All right, you know, I, I, I try TensorFlow and, and, and the functions it gives me as the approximation to x squared are like constant functions or zero function. And so this is very poor. And I know then I must be doing something wrong. I call Boris Hanin, say, what, what have I done wrong? He tells me various things that are the state of the art. That is, you have to really choose a network with, which are wide, and uh, you have to use the slow learning rates and so on. So the point of this is that you can't just uh, take an off-the-shelf algorithm for learning, throw in your problem, and walk away and, and come back and get a good fit. It doesn't work that way. After you do some, uh, you know, state art work of designing the algorithm, you will get a reasonably good fit. But I don't see a theorem in the form that do this, and I guarantee you that you will get a good fit with a certain accuracy. Okay, so I think I have two minutes. And in this two minutes, I want to uh, turn to uh, generalization error, which I alluded to already. And it's peculiar to me that uh, this idea of generalization error has supplanted what mathematicians would usually like, which is a certified theorem that says, I guarantee you a certain error that is the norm of f minus f hat is small if you use my technology. Because this, this would be certifiability of a, a, a learning algorithm if you had an explicit error estimate. But instead, what's done in practice is one looks at the test data and, for example, looks at a square loss and says, OK, we, we train and we find that this loss is small. And so good, we have a good fit to our function f hat. Is this truly a good fit? What can you say in terms of certifiable performance? And the answer is, well, you can't say anything with certainty, right? Because the, the, the draws that you have of the data, as I mentioned, could be good draws or bad draws. Now, you may say, well, I'll say something in terms of expected error, that even though the quantity I've computed, I can't guarantee that the true error is bounded by this quantity or anything related to it. Maybe I can say something about that with high probability on the draw that this would be the case. And if you go into that world, then the best you can say is that the error with high probability, the true error behaves like this, where m prime is the number uh, uh, of elements in the test set. So you could think of m prime as replaced by m. Notice the minus a half, which comes up from concentration of measure inequalities. And even though epsilon m may be very small, right? much smaller than m to the minus one half, I'll never get a certification that I'm performing uh, near optimally. Can I get one minute to finish this last slide, Greg? All right, go ahead. Then we'll have to move on. Yeah. So 
Uh, simple example, take the Baron class, dimension one, it's the toy example, approximation rate is n to the minus two, if n is the number of parameters, gal found width is m to the minus two when m is the number of data, point uh, wise gal found width is m to the minus three halves, average gal found width is m to the minus three halves log m. This would be, if I knew the model class, injected it into my algorithm, I should be able to get this rate. If I do generalization error, I, I'll, I'll only get this. I will never get close to the optimal performance. Bottom line, I don't see generalization error as a good concept to measure whether you are performing near optimal rate or get, giving you good guarantees on performance. Okay, I stopped there. I, I, Sorry that I took a minute over and that I sort of rushed through these last parts, but I'll stop at this point. Okay. No problem. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, if you anyone.